All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. I am Katie Cleaver. And I'm Elizabeth Mills. And I'm Melissa Stafford. And we're a couple of nurses chatting nursey stuff. <laughs> and today we're gonna we're gonna bring it back to the basics. Okay. Yes, this episode is titled Back to Nursing Basics. And before I get into the actual content of it, if you want our show notes um, or anything that we're gonna reference, you can find those at freshrn.com slash forty two. All right. Freshrn.com slash forty two. 42. And I'm going to have a link on there for a mini course called Finish Strong. For those of you who are finishing up nursing school and are very confused about when you need to get your job lined up, when you need to sign up for the NCLEX, what NCLEX prep, and how to get your license, I have a little class that's for free and it walks you through that. So link to that is at freshrn.com slash 42. All right, guys, let's get into back to nursing basics. Okay, tell me, okay, Melissa felt strongly about having this episode, <laughs> and I completely agreed with her, but I want to know what in, inspired you to, like, have us talk about this. I just feel like, you know, when, you, when you're when you in nursing school, they, they teach you the basics. They talk about things like brushing your teeth, or turning the patients, or um, how to help a patient get up out of bed to go to the bathroom. But once you get into the real life and get into orientation, you tend to focus on... Um, the cool stuff, the harder stuff. Yes. Let me learn how to start an IV. Yes. Let me learn how to draw blood. Let me learn how to change a central line dressing or Meds. whatever the task is. Yeah. You tend to focus on those <clears throat> things that because they're harder, so to speak. Um, and, and they are essential to your job and I don't want to minimize their importance. But so much of what we do, the basic stuff of what we do is really, really important. Mm-hmm. So I notice a lot of nurses in the unit that I work in forget the importance of going in and turning a patient every two hours. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a task on the work list, so to speak, but it's still something that needs to be done. No, wait. Turning someone, does that mean putting a flat pillow under their hip? <laughs> no, it does not <laughs> mean putting a flat pillow under their hip. Um, you really need to, when you're turning a patient, you need to turn them enough that you are truly shifting the burden of their weight most places say around 45 degree angle and if you think about how far a 45 degree angle is it's actually pretty far far. so using one little flat pillow two little flat pillows is not going to be enough you Mm -hmm. really need to make sure that you clear the sacrum from the bed and that they are shifted off the spine you know the patients that have kyphosis the curved spine that sticks out i mean any any you know, speaking of let me sit up no. straight. Oh, wait, okay <laughs> it just makes me take them. everybody sit up sit up Shoot. straight we all have kyphosis <laughs> um but any of those bony promin- prominences that touch the bed are a potential source of breakdown and right. that can be a hip bone that can be a tailbone that can be the spine that can be the shoulder blade that can be an ear. I was just thinking that, their ear. Yeah. You know, and it, you know, and too, it's like mm. you turn them on their side, but you don't just turn them on their side and throw two pillows behind their back. You need to put one in between their legs yes. and under that arm on the top or the the top arm, like under that elbow, to keep them all what I like to call pillified. You know, <laughs> the official term. Like, like truly tucked and flush. Did I teach you that word? I can't remember if it's you or Nikki. <laughs> oh wait, Aww. Nikki might have taught us I both think that word. She yeah. taught me the hey, art Nikki. of pillow-fying yes. a patient appropriately and truly like turning them all the way even if they hate it even if the patient's like i don't want to i hate i'm not comfortable on that side you you negotiate with them hey can i get an hour yes like let me get a little time to give that butt a break and you are gonna even though it might be uncomfortable now it's it, a big picture it's so much better for you mm-hmm. so so things like turning are so important and like we truly can cause life-changing injury Mm -hmm. simply from that and 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 i don't want people too to think well if that's a younger person they should be fine or they're probably fine moving themselves i've seen like i remember having younger patients in neuro where they were neuro compromised and pretty out of it like even though they were younger they can't turn themselves well and just because they can doesn't mean they do oh that's very good so ooh, tell me that again <laughs> just because they can turn themselves doesn't mean they do turn right. themselves so saying that a patient turns themselves you should be saying that you're visually watching this patient reposition themselves and redistribute their weight mm-hmm. it doesn't mean just raising the head and lowering the head of bed that's not what that means it really does mean taking pressure off the bottom i mean Honestly, I had a patient, this was long, actually before I was in the ICU, he came in, was what you would consider a walkie-talkie, I guess, where he was completely alert, oriented, had full-blown conversations, 
but he worked on a farm and no joking, literally spent most of the day on a tractor. I want you to know that said gentleman who was fully capable of getting up and walking came in with a pressure sore so bad that he had to go to the OR to have it debrided. Yep. And they're a farmer. They don't want, they wait till it's, they're dying yeah. to come he, in. He literally one day was like shifting back and forth in the chair and he's like, gosh, my butt, my butt just hurts. Like, mm. I don't know why it hurts. I just can't get comfortable. And I'm, I'm like, I, you know, I don't know. Let's try pillows. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then finally at one point I'm like, let me just help you get back to bed. See if we can get you comfortable and rolled him over. And he, he was a very dark skinned man. So when you have very dark skin, you don't necessarily see the mm-hmm. red, mm-hmm. like someone who's, pale like me you know my skin would turn red in a heartbeat we'll find out real quick on me <laughs> right but if you have someone who's really dark skin it doesn't you don't necessarily see that redness the mm-hmm. skin just looked darker to be honest with you um so when a nurse practitioner came in i said would you take a look at this and so she did and she ended up consulting they ended up consulting plastic surgery who wow. literally came to the bedside and took a scalpel and carved pieces of skin <laughs> and i'm like he didn't feel any of it mm. it was all dead all that pain that he had been having was his bottom, his gluteus maximus infarcting. Mm. Not kidding. Mm. So it got Holy to the point where the surgeon was like, you know, this is this is too deep. I'm going to have to take him to the OR. And they did. And he had to come back with a wound back. And Just think if you would have left that and, and just pass it on the next nurse. He just I can't know. get comfortable. Like the poor fellow. Son of a gun. I think. And he wasn't in the hospital that long. That was not a hospital acquired injury. That was. For sure. That, that takes a long time. Yes. But, oh my yes. goodness. But. You know, obviously that's an extreme case, but you have someone who comes in in the ICU who's very frail, who yes. has low um, pl- protein levels in the blood from their illness. They don't, their skin integrity is very much at risk. So you taking 30 seconds to go find somebody to help you turn that patient can make a huge difference. You know, and I highly recommend as you consider your time management, like I, the way that I look at a shift, especially, you know, it differs between a, a med surge and an ICU, but like having that as part of your rounds yes. and your, like, you just know whether or not your CNA is available, that you, that's going to be a priority. Like, so for me with an ICU, it's like, okay, I get a report. I see my one patient, I do an assessment, then I go to my other patient, then I do their meds and their assessment, then I document my abnormals and I get their turn in. Then I go back and then I do my um, meds, meds and, and, the, turn. and turn. And then, then I catch up on the charting, then you go back for your second sweep and you turn again. Yeah. And then you just have that in your routine. And, and on a med surge unit, you need to rely on your CNAs more because you know that's a lot of people. But a lot of times on med surge, you have some patients who can legitimately turn themselves. Yes. A lot of times in the ICU, you just might as well assume that they can't. Is is if I they, pretty much always assume so, they can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't care. You're yeah, going to turn, please, sir. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> the, to have the strength to be able to put their arms down on their sides and move their butt. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of ICU, especially if they're on any sedation or any whatever. Like, they a lot of them can't do that themselves. So it's really important to can like. It, increase the level of importance that has like that's you know your meds are important getting your meds on time and stuff but if you're not turning your patient all day holy moly the skin is the largest organ in the body so it is if we're not i mean we're worried about the brain and we're worried about the heart and we're worried about the lungs and the liver and the kidneys we got to worry about the skin too yeah and then they can get septic and boom um and i know like i would i would actually like in the process of turning that would be part of my neuro assessment because i'm yeah. like okay you yes, know let's is. pick your arm up we're gonna yeah. you know it help you know uh, that's like the Look mark of like elbows. the like yeah. experienced nurse is weaving all that stuff in yep. right every time i go into the room i'm doing as much as i can with yep. each interaction so that means like a neuro check and i'm and being attentive to how they're responding to what I'm, you know, and then I'm also when you're turning, you're looking, you're looking at their skin again, you know, or like in the morning, I remember you taught me this because for those of you that don't know, Elizabeth taught me how to be a neuro ICU nurse a couple <laughs> of years ago. But like any time in the morning when you, when we're turning in for the first time, you're going to listen to their posterior lung sounds at that time. Like, mm-hmm. and then you're going to get a look, good look at their back. And that's, that's just part of your routine. And that's how you do it. You know, um, good job. You retain that after all this time. I yeah. <laughs> I draw this it has been a while. But like engraving or ingraining those habits in and, and maximizing every time you go into that room. Um, I think that's really important. So okay, we've talked about how important turns are. What else? Give me some more basics, guys. 
the value of incentive spirometry mm-hmm. for our patients, mm-hmm. post-op patients, of course, but every patient, there's mm-hmm. a value to that. How many times have you seen that it's been charted and they don't have one? Oh, my. Or, <laughs> yeah, it's gracious. not even out of the package. <laughs> she's, like, she's been doing this 10 times an hour. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wait, wait, well, or it's out of the package, and what do they do? They suck on it, like, or they suck. They su- <laughs> yes. But watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an explicit episode, y'all. No, no, no. That sounded terrible. I'm so embarrassed, y'all. <laughs> My face is so red. It is red. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, gonna, it's not red anymore. It's okay. No, it is. It is. I can totally tell. <laughs> Underneath the earphones, my ears are red. <laughs> They're covering. They're it's burning. Okay. I know that's going in the intro, right? <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna hide. <laughs> but no, like, or, or actually, to tag onto that, or how many times I've had an amp- I worked on a vascular floor, so I'd have patients who would not have both of their legs, but their penal pulses would be charted. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Come on, y'all. Right. Don't right. That. My favorite is there's this one particular surgeon, and you would round with him, and he would say to the said patient. Show me how you do this incentive spirometer. Mm-hmm. And oh. I'm like, I've been telling, we've been doing it, we've been doing it, we've <laughs> been doing on, it. But they're like, oh. it. they're like, oh, they're <laughs> <laughs> like, you liar. What that is. And I'm like, and of course, surgeon would look and he's like, make sure you're educating. And I'm like, he just doesn't remember. We have been doing it. But he's neurologically compromised. I, I know, I know. But that would always, yeah. that always, uh, he, oh, oh. But, but teaching the patients and their families the value of it you yeah. know like oh my gosh. let's remember that the whole point is to help your patient take a very deep breath in which helps get air down into the very deepest part of the lungs to help open up all those little alveoli and you know like when you don't have that you develop atelectasis which can turn into a full-blown pneumonia oh, yeah. i mean it, it really is a very valuable tool in helping make sure that patients maintain good respiratory function mm-hmm. um to help, you know, if they start to get a fever, is it, are you giving them the incentive spirometer because of the fever? No. But if that fever is related to the fact they're developing atelectasis in their lungs, guess what? You open those little alveoli spaces back open and then their the lungs are going to be able to clear fluid better. Mm-hmm. You're going to get mm-hmm. better air exchange. Mm-hmm. It will end up helping that. I mean, there's a huge value in that and teaching them the right way to do the incentive spirometry mm-hmm. too, because it's, <laughs> All right, you know, not real fast. This is what I want. Okay. Oh, pretend gosh. I'm your patient and you're teaching me. <gasps> Tell, <laughs> you're going to put me on the spot. I'm now. putting you on the spot. <laughs> teach me. Uh, teach me. What is this thing? Do I got to do it? Yes, you absolutely do have to do this. What do I have to do this? So this is going to help your lung function, Katie. Oh. I want to, I want to do some exercise for your lungs, much like we help you exercise and get up out of the bed. We have to exercise those lungs too. You just had surgery yesterday, so we have to make sure that there's good air getting all the way mm. down into the bottom part of your lungs. And so let me show you this lovely little contraption. We'll make a game out of it today. So, you know, there's two chambers on the incentive spirometer. There's one that has a, a larger valve that gives you the volume of air that, that you're bringing into your lungs, which everybody focuses on because if you get all the way to the top, it's the best, right? If you get that white, well, and mine is white. If you get that white circle all the way to the top, I'm the best. But what really you need to work on is, is the technique of taking a deep breath in. So instead mm-hmm. of taking a very quick, deep breath, very fast, you need to take a very slow and long deep breath. So you want to gather as much air as you possibly can. I guess I could, you know, I know you don't, you don't just want to, you know, you really want to do a very slow, deep, long inhale, which really helps work the air into the, the very deepest part of the lung tissue basically. Mm -hmm. And, and holding that as long as you can is what's really hard. And what I tell people honestly is if you're doing it right, you're going to get shorter breath. Yeah. It's hard work. Yeah. When, when my stepdaughter had abdominal surgery, she had a ruptured appendix, oh. and they brought one in, and she hated it because it made her tummy hurt. Oh, yeah. And so I taught her how to splint, and for those of you who don't know how to do that, you can use a pillow or a blanket that's folded up and, and hold it tightly up against the abdomen. If you've had abdominal surgery or, like, if you've had heart surgery, you can hold it up against the chest. If you've had lung surgery, hold it up against your rib cage, and it really kind of helps offset the pain of taking a good deep breath because most people don't like to do that. But we made a game out of it. So obviously I can cheat because I have access to an extra incentive spirometer. And fortunately in the hospital that she was in, I just asked nicely for it. And they're like, absolutely. So that's how I motivated her mm-hmm. is we literally made a game out of who could make that that valve rise 
highest, but you had to do it the right way. Yeah. Because the small little chamber says best, better, and good. And it's a very slow, deep breath. And you hold that little, tiny little valve in the best area. And that's when you're really getting the biggest workout for your lungs. <laughs> it's hard. Well, and It's that, really hard. I love, like, like, figuring out innovative ways to, like, encourage people to do that stuff. Like, you know, like, and involving the uh, loved ones. So mm-hmm. making a game out of it. Or what I've done before is, like, told the patient, okay, you're watching TV. I want you to do that three or four times for every commercial break. Yep. And then tell the loved one, hey, your job. <laughs> is to make sure that they do that. And every time they do it, uh, during a commercial break, I want you to make a mark on the whiteboard or something like that mm-hmm. to involve them in care. Because a lot of times they're sitting there and don't have anything to do anyway or right. whatever. So that to increase compliance. Because, you know, they get the, they get the atelectasis, then they can get that pneumonia. Then they're, like, going to be in the hospital yep. longer. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, and they don't know that. They re- they have no idea that that is what you're trying to prevent. Um, and it's up to us to educate them about that. They don't, they're... Like most people have pretty low health literacy levels, right? Correct. Um, yeah. And we can't assume that they're going to understand the importance of it. It's our job to explain it to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so can't underestimate that at all. You know what I did? I may I got an incentive spirometer for all of the new nurses in the unit one day, and I said, "Show me how you do this." <gasps> oh, I love every it. single one of them did it incorrectly. All of them did. I believe that. And they were like, "What do you mean?" So I I taught them the correct way to do it, and they're like. Wow, that makes such a huge difference oh, yeah. in the benefit of that tool, honestly. Yeah. And using and using that tool the right way, it really does change how much lung function, how much benefit you're gonna get out of it. So it was it was fun and they enjoyed it because we all had a good laugh and they're you know, then they started having little competitions with each other. Yeah. Because they're young, they're healthy, they have good lungs, they should be able <laughs> to make that thing go all the way to the top, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Which they can unless they're doing it the right way. Mm-hmm. And then they learn very quickly that that takes a lot more effort. And so, patients will cough, too. After. Yes, they will cough. And it's, a, and it's mobilizing secretions. all that junk in, yeah. in your yeah. lungs. So. And if we want to prevent those, like in our last episode, we were talking about um, rapid response like and respiratory issues. Yeah. Like if we're aggressive with this incentive spirometer early on, yeah. like we can prevent that kind of stuff yeah. by getting that gunk out of there. Make a difference. I know patients don't want to, but if we have them snowed and cuddled up in bed for three days <laughs> and they're not breathing deep, they're going to get pneumonia and they're going to get a, a, a obstructive bowel. Like it's up to us to, uh, get those them. organs you have to act as a motivator. <sighs> yeah. Actually, a coach. so that, that actually reminds me of like a really good way I've heard this described is so a patient who comes in for, whatever their issue is, there's typically this kind of pathway we expect, you know, your subarachnoid, you know, your pneumonia, your sepsis, your whatever, like there's this kind of path we expect them to go down. And us as nurses are kind of like their guides Mm -hmm. and they don't know what steps they need to take. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's important. And we can Mm -hmm. either be a complacent disengaged guide, or we can be motivated and proactive and say, and here's the incentive spirometer. This is going to help you get farther. You know, here's this. And then, you know, here, here's why you need to get up and walk. Here's why we need to switch from IV to PO pain meds. Here's why you need to eat. We have to tell them that stuff. They're leaning on us to, um, tell them when things like patients, uh, how do I want to say this? A lot of patients were going to wait until we tell them something is important. Mm-hmm. A lot of them will, will be compliant and want to do that stuff, but a lot of them don't know what's important or why it's important. And it's mm-hmm. up to us to proactively educate them about that or else we're going to see those complications. We're going to have the providers upset because they've put in these orders for incentive spirometer, walking, um, eating and all that kind of stuff. And it's not getting done because mm-hmm. we're kicking back and being complacent. Well, no, you're focused on other things that you think are important, but you're not necessarily recognizing the value of the basics. Yeah. And it really does. We have to figure out a way to include all of that in our nursing care. Mm -hmm. That's what's really going to make us the most successful nurses is being able to figure out how to fit the very basic elements into our very busy day. We do have a lot of things that we have to get done every day. And I think that we need to make sure that we don't lose track of those little things, quote unquote. Because ultimately, they're really big things. Oh, they're huge. And I think as a new nurse, it's really, you know, you're, it's harder to learn that more complex stuff, which you need to learn. You need to, you need to get your mind around that stuff. But I think once you get your mind around that stuff, those things you learned that were easier at the beginning, like putting those all back in the picture and it's all part of it and, and, and weaving all of that into your continuous care that you're providing, I think. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and chat about more basics. All right, guys, we're back. 
we are going to chat more about some nursing basics. So what one would you guys like to discuss next? Let's talk about accurate keeping up with your intake and output. Oh, that is <laughs> nice. Yes, it's very important to do that. I think that, um, all joking aside, regardless of the patient population, because I could get on a whole tangent on fluid balance for the neuro population, <clears throat> like I could do a whole three episodes on that, really. <laughs> but, you know, think about your cardiovascular patients that have heart failure, for example. Think about your fresh post-op cabbage patients. Think about your patients that just had a lung transplant or patients in renal failure who might not be processing their fluids very well. Every single cc of fluid that goes in and every single cc of fluid that comes out really should be accounted for in your eyes and nose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my huge soapboxes is think about how much fluid a patient drinks during the day. Because in my facility, a patient gets a 240 cc cup of probably iced tea, to be honest with you, we're in the South. <laughs> um, and everybody, so when you look at look at the intake for the day, they got 240 cc's with each tray, and that's what's documented. But I can pretty much guarantee you that whether it be you or a CNA or a family member or another nurse that was walking by have gotten them a glass of water mm -hmm. or another soda or, you know a nice cup of coffee, there's something else that patient is taking in. So I encourage you to really engage your family, same way, like with the incentive spirometer and getting your the family member to help advocate. Get the family member to be in charge for keeping track of whatever the patient's drinking. I've done that before, and I've had family members really appreciate that job because yes. it's not – quite a, it's it's a little more challenging than marking off like incentive spirometer but right. like oh okay so you had 200 i'll write it up here and then i come in the room and they're like so i put the latest one on the board yeah. i know they're so proud of themselves <laughs> so too it's so cute and it's a great way to involve them yes and in a simple way that gives them something to do and I'm, it's incredibly helpful yes because i know what i bring the patient but i don't know what anybody else has brought the patient right unless i happen to see it sitting at the bedside when i'm in there mm -hmm. so i don't know if somebody went to a coffee shop and brought them a giant, you know, cup of coffee Which they do. or somebody went to the cafeteria and bought them some Gatorade because they really wanted something with flavor or, you know, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. a smoothie from a local smoothie shop. Yeah. You know, whatever the case may be, you need to make sure that you're accounting for all of that because we don't know all the time every output, mm -hmm. right? So we need to know what is the patient taking in compared to maybe what is their weight, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so we need to know that's kind of how we gauge I's and O's as well as weight in figuring out what's going on with the patient. So if I'm taking in a liter of fluids and I have no idea what that patient's putting out, then do I need to give them Lasix to get them to pee more? Right. Mm -hmm. Or are they in DI and they're peeing out a crazy amount of fluid? So mm -hmm. I actually have to give them more, even though they drank a liter, they actually need three. Mm -hmm. um, it really matters because you could determine if the patient needs more fluid or needs medicine to get rid of fluid or, yeah, so or what have you. So the, essentially like this, while it seems like a really minor task for us, it's actually really a big part of clinical decision making. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Because operationally the way it works is like, especially if you've got nephrology on board, it, mm -hmm. it, the provider's looking at those hard numbers. Mm -hmm. They're not going in the room counting however many things are on. <laughs> How many tick marks are, are on the board. <laughs> right. They are 100% counting on your documentation to be accurate. And then they're looking at that INO summary and, and making a clinical decision based upon that. So if you're not putting that in correctly, inappropriate decisions are going to be made. And if you have a system where your IV pumps communicate with the electronic medical record and you're not keeping track of your IV fluid intake and then oh. I come on in the morning and I'm calculating my IV fluid intake and I've got 5,000 cc's extra that you don't IV know where it came in, from? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That, yeah, I mean that makes such a big difference. It then, does. It really, really does. I have a story. I tallied all my outputs one day or like fluid wise and I looked at the INO. I came in and the patient was 2 million cc's positive. <gasps> no. Million. 2 million. What? It's like what do you mean there are 2 million cc's positive? And what had happened is the patient had received a dose of mannitol like three days before that, and nobody ever ended that. And because oh, so it was it, never ended, it thought it was still running. At what? I Well, at, you know we give boluses of mannitol. Right. So it, we, we were giving like, say. Like 9.99 a minute? Basically. 
for so two for million. Days. I had to go back and go back and stop oh my that. Gosh. And Could you imagine that in a, in, a, else. in a litigation? Oh my gosh, it was it was insane. But it really does matter when you use your medical record to make sure you go back if, oh, yeah. it, if you have that convenience of the pumps communicating. It's a wonderful tool. But it's you got to right. right. check it. Yeah, you know, and two, especially with those patients in the in the ICU that have multiple lines going yes. and mo- like you can easily give somebody 400 mils an hour of, of fluid total right easy easy between your your drips like your your vasoactive drips your med lines and your They're antibiotics blood, right. and blood like you can you can give a ton of fluid in and if you're just if you're not like measuring any output like or if you're this wouldn't be that same scenario but a patient like you're not putting a hat in the toilet <laughs> no it's so easy it to drive me crazy it's like it's so easy to just throw that in there and if your cna isn't doing it it is your responsibility as that patient's nurse to ensure that that is done. And if your CNA is not doing it, you need to chat with them. Yeah. Because, again, clinical decision making here. If it wasn't charted, it wasn't done. Yeah. But, you know, and thinking of, we talked about input. So you have IV fluid input, intake. You have um, your blood. If you're giving blood, you have antibiotics. You have vasopressors. You have TPN. fluid fluid from like PO intake, you have TPN, lipids, tube feeding. I mean, there's a lot of different places that the patient gets volume. So you have to make sure you're accounting for all that. But then you need to do your best at making sure you're tracking all the output. So you talking about putting a hat in the toilet is something that's very simple to do. Do it. Use a urinal. Have a guy pee in a urinal. If they need to stand up the toilet, by all means, have at it. But, you know, at least use the jug. Right. I mean, most guys are okay <laughs> with that. Yeah. Um, guys, we have a whole lot easier. We can use a condom cath or, you know, a pouch of some sort. Girls, you know, there's some tools there now, too, that we can track there things. There sure are, but they're very specific. They are very specific. Um, and when we can use those tools, they're great resources to mm-hmm. track output. But if you can't track that output, well, let me before I even go there. Don't forget about your chest tubes. Oh, mm-hmm. Don't forget about drains. if you happen to have a fecal management system, mm-hmm. if you have drains of any kind. Like, there's a lot of possible output sources, oh, too. Oh, yeah. Like, it's really, like, and that, again, is clinical decision making. Like, neurosurgeons are looking at how much is coming out of that EVD. S- s- cardiovascular or cardiothoracic surgeons are looking closely at that chest tube. Mm-hmm. You have got to chart your output because yeah. that's how they determine when to take it out. They can't just x-ray them every... <laughs> six hours like they need to look at that drainage and i can't tell you like working on day shift how many times this surgeon like is frustrated that the night shift nurse didn't mark it because they don't know how much when it came like it, it, yeah it, that makes such a big difference how do we know if all of a sudden now they're dumping right we don't mm-hmm. we have we don't and it's so important to like like because what i would do is uh, at 1600 i would make sure that was my like that at, at sixteen hundred every day around that time when I was doing that those rounds that was always my I and O time mm-hmm. like that was like I have to make sure that I I'm up to date you know and hopefully I can do it again before the next before I leave but at least I know that I've got it done then because mm-hmm. um, guys it makes such a big difference it does and you can't say it enough clinical decisions are being made on intake and output mm-hmm. so you really have to be responsible making sure you capture all of that and in the ICU setting it's sometimes an hour every two hours every four hours when they're looking at that those, those yeah. volumes yes they do look at it every hour every hour but you know that goes into weight so you talk about basic nursing care yeah weights uh. daily weights mm-hmm. and not all nurses are responsible like a lot of places use their cnas but you have to really think about when you're weighing that patient you it should be done at the same time every day mm-hmm. If you do it on night shift, great. If you do it on day shift, fine. But whatever time of day is your weight, it should be done the same time every day. For the same reason they tell us when we're weighing ourselves to get up in the morning Mm -hmm. and take your weight first thing in the morning. So whatever time you choose to do it, be consistent. But you also have to think about if you're using a bed scale, what's on the bed? Oh, those SCD pumps, y'all. The SCD (laughs) pumps. Did Nana get 10 blankets last night because she was freezing? It's time to take all 10 of those off for just a minute. I'll give them right back, I promise. (laughs) But you need to take them off for a minute. Did an O2 tank get put on the end of the bed? Oh, yes. What about a Foley bag? If that Foley bag hasn't been emptied and it's full... That Foley bag is really heavy. And then paying attention when you put in the value to compare. Just just quickly look mm-hmm. and see what the last one was. A lot of times, though, the, the EMR, hey, this is 
a bigger like a change of more than 10 percent <laughs> overnight are you sure this is right yeah but we really need to be making sure that and then because i've done that before i'm like oh and then i see that i hadn't emptied the fully yeah or whatever or the a lot of times for me it was scd pump i always forgot about that thing. <laughs> the, and then it's like mine oh, was okay. all the 10 million blankets and pillows that were on the bed I had oh to yes take because off. of the pillow <laughs> that's right <laughs> and we're back yes <laughs> But you have to think about all that stuff. You do. You do. Yeah. There's so much for us to think about. But it, again, back to basics. It makes a difference. It all right. Does. So one I wanted to talk about was the importance of oral care. Oh, my gosh. And yes. not just on ventilated patients. I have a story. I had a patient um, who was emaciated. Mm-hmm. He would, it, I mean, he, he had a lot, a lot going on. Um, but one of the things and he he wasn't in an icu or anything like that and he had therapy speech therapy and um i think oral care on floors can get lost because so many patients can do it themselves yeah a lot of times on the floor they can do it themselves and what they need is for us to be like hey you brush your teeth today like (laughs) a lot of times that's all we need to do but if you have those patients who can't you need to do it for them and it's not quite as routine with like as in like in the icu with your with your um um, like those nice oral care kits, like that, that with the suction, they don't have that on the floors, and it was not part of my routine. And I was like, I think I gave him like a swab and stuff, but that and just swabbed out his mouth real quick. And then um, speech therapy came in, and like looked closely at his mouth, and he had this huge thing on the top of his mouth that she like pulled out. And it's oh, like no, no wonder he couldn't like swallow. And she, I mean, he was very much out of it as well but it's like oh like i was clearly not doing my due diligence in that and how that can make a big difference or patients who need their teeth like to eat and we're not we're just getting them pureed food because that's the best thing to do it's like well maybe we should ask the wife you gotta think about you know secretions like just the normal i get my teeth are nasty when I wake up in the morning. I have to mm. brush my teeth. I don't feel normal until I brush my teeth. Right, as many of us don't. So you know, I make jokes all the time. There's no, there's no stinky breath going on in here. We're gonna brush yeah. your teeth today. Yes. You know, and that's fine. Like we get to do that. But um, the other part is secretions in the back of the throat. So we really do have to do suctioning. Yes. And we have to clear out all those secretions that may be actually pretty far down the back of the throat because they will solidify yes. and, and become obstructions yes. and cause respiratory yes. distress. <laughs> Especially if the air's dry, which it always is in the hospital. Uh, I'm yes. going to tell you a story. Tell me. I was oh, a, this will be good. I was a new uh, neuro ICU RN. And uh, my patient, I was a night shift nurse, and my patient was having trouble with their O2 sats. And I had to call our lovely intensivist, who is an, I have so much respect for now. But he wasn't so nice. But anyway, um, I was like, I think we need a chest x-ray. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my patient's not doing well. Sats are doing this. And I kept going up on oxygen. And we got a chest x-ray. And that chest x-ray was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I just don't know what's going on. So I actually called an ICU nurse to come help me out. Because I was, I think I was... I was in the neuro ICU at the time, but I was like the most seasoned nurse in the neuro ICU. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. She got back in the back of that throat, did some good oral care, and we pulled out what looked like a small animal. <laughs> I was going to use that reference. <laughs> you, you pulled small I have animals seen back. And I'm not down. kidding. Gross. Sats went up. Breathing got much better. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, basic why? Yes. Why care. didn't I think of that? Mm-hmm. Well, and you know what? I've seen that too. I'm thinking I'm, something worse is happening. Right. We get... And all it was was secretions. All that, it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I mentioned this in that course, that ICU course. I say, check your bases to save your faces, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you got to... Ch- like, don't freak out about the SCD pump not working. If, check if it's plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Like, or like, okay, yeah. the O2 sat's going down. Okay, we got any oxygen on them. Yeah. Like, you know, like, are they sitting yep. up? Like, oh, they're not, like, they're O2 sets. Okay, let's sit them up. Yep. Yeah. Let's, you know, or they're kind of sleepy. I don't know if they're, oh, oh, like, if I'm having a neuro change. We'll turn them bright lights on and wake them up. And if they're not responding, yeah, we got a problem. Mm-hmm. But if you're just going in there mousy, like, hey, Mr. Smith, are you awake? <laughs> like, <laughs> I think it, I can't wait to do a video, guys, with, with these two where it's, like, the difference between a neuro nurse waking a patient up and a, and a non-neuro nurse. <gasps> But, yeah, but like, yeah. check your bases yeah. to save your faces, y'all. Yeah. Like, ch- oral care, um, like, turning and, and checking, like, 
okay, are things plugged in appropriately and connected appropriately? Like, do I've you s- have suction set up in your room? Oh God, that is my soapbox. Oh yes, because when because fair one to have. Mm-hmm. It's when when you need it, you need it now, and you, and it takes a minute. Mm-hmm. It takes a minute to set up, but it's it reminds me of like the times where it's like the patient's ventilated, and alarms start going off, and the oh my God, I'm freaking, what's going on? Oh my gosh. And it's like, they're looking at the ventilator and it's like, um, it just, it just got disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but so but we're like, oh, and we assume it's Something's the very compli- complicated thing. And, and sometimes it is, mm-hmm. but it's really important to check our bases. And I think that just comes with experience. It, it's, it's something that comes with experience. Yeah. And, you know, but learning it. Yeah. It takes time to get there. So yeah. So don't always jump to it being like this complex thing. Sometimes it's, the basic stuff that can really make a big difference. Yeah. I'm suctioning out and mm-hmm. oral. And, uh, yeah. So my, my take homes on oral care are making sure that we're doing it Yes, because it prevents um, VAP big yeah. thing in the, mm-hmm. in the ICU, but then also on the floor, huge. And, and a lot of times on the floor, it's more so like, Hey, like, gross brush your teeth <laughs> and you don't even well don't say gross but you don't even have to tell yeah. them to say okay hey you know or maybe your cna is going to do it but making sure it's done okay i got your toothbrush and i got your toothpaste yeah. i put it in the bathroom so when you go to the bathroom first thing this morning go ahead and take care of that and then and then you just peek to see if that toothbrush is wet and then you can uh, <laughs> or <laughs> dirty or you know uh, uh, sometimes uh, they just say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so making sure that you're doing it, um, and and if you have patients that are not compliant with it, like hey, it's really important so that you can get out of here to keep your your mouth clean. Um, also with oral care, um, if the patient has dentures and they need to eat, like it's helpful to you know have those dentures. I have had had patients who are hesitant to bring them in or wives or husbands or whatever because they don't want to lose them, which I get because they're very expensive. But yes. if you can't eat, like, that's a big deal. So making sure you have that kind of stuff with um, uh, available so they can eat appropriately. Mm-hmm. Any more take-homes on oral care? I, I mean, I, I think you hit the big ones, honestly. Like, it, it really is important for pneumonia, prevention of pneumonia and whatnot regardless of whether or not they actually have a breathing tube. It is more important and with a breathing just tube. dental no, hygiene. I, say that. I mean. It is dental hygiene. <laughs> you know what's funny, as I've realized, is when patients come into the hospital, suddenly they don't want to wash their hands or brush their teeth or put on their own socks. <laughs> <laughs> or just, you know, sometimes they don't even want to wash themselves. <laughs> I know. I know. And so it's, again, we've got to encourage them and guide them. And sometimes they're afraid of pain, afraid of doing too much. And we've got to be the one that encourages them yes. and um, empowers them to take part in their own ADLs and not enable them. Mm-hmm. And yep. I think a really helpful talking point, because a lot of times we do, we, we can run into patients who want us to do as much that we're willing to do for them. Mm-hmm. But we some we have to be use our assertiveness and in, in in a kind way, saying, you know what, I I know you want me to help you with eating. Like I've had patients who I know they can feed themselves, but they want me to feed them. Mm-hmm. But I, but I I need them to feed themselves because they're not going to get out of here if they don't. So framing it in kind of a way where it's like, look, I'm here to help you do whatever you can, whatever you can't do for yourself. Anything that you can do, even if it's small, even if it's a tiny win, we got to count it. Mm-hmm. Even if that's feeding yourself half this dinner. And then, and then your wife or whomever can help with the rest, but it's really important that you do as much for yourself as possible. Empowering the, the patient is really important. I love that you said, you know, empower them, don't enable them because you're right. We really have to get them involved in their own self-care. And sometimes it's the patient that wants us to do everything for mm-hmm. them. Sometimes it's the family that wants us to do everything mm-hmm. for them. And, you know, really making sure that we're spending time and educating the family and the patient on the importance of doing it themselves as much as they possibly can. And sometimes it's, you know, I really need to see what you can do. Right. Yeah, but let me just see what right. you can do. Do your very best. Come on. I believe in you. You can do this. And yeah. then sometimes it's actually a shock for them to realize they can actually do more than what they thought they could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it's, you know what, if it hurts, we'll get you some pain medicine. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I tell you what, I, I guess right now is a bad time for physical therapy because you're hurting. Let me go get you some medicine. And in 30 minutes, the physical therapist will be back and we're going to get up and we're going to move. Mm-hmm. We're just going to give it a try, see how much we can do. And knowing that you're planning... And trying to advocate for them that way sometimes is just the motivation that they need to really make progress 
because ultimately everybody wants to go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we got to make sure they're they can go back home and function. Very yeah. true. So one of my things that I think I like to encourage people to do is to have that conversation at the beginning of the shift, right? Like when you get your report and you think you see, okay, here's the stuff we're going to do for the day. And, and you can do this as a new nurse when you understand what we're going to do for the day is like, hey, here's our goals. We're going to sit in the chair for all three meals. We're going to go on two walks. Yeah. I want you to eat more than half your meals. And I want us to try to switch from IV pain meds to maybe let's switch to PO or oral yeah. <laughs> oral pain meds. You know, and at the beginning of the day, if they can know, okay, they're going to try and get me up for every meal. They're going to try to, we're going to try and do two. That's different than you coming in out of the blue and they finally were like, okay, I'm going to close my eyes for five minutes. And you come in and you're like, all right, get up. We're going for a walk. Like having, giving the patient as much like a heads up yep. and best possible chance to do as well as possible, mm -hmm. I guess, is, is, uh, is helpful. Any, any, any degree of predictability, even though it's very small, is very helpful. I think for patients. Oh, they, they love that. Cause they, they need to know what so the plan's going to be. Cause they are out of it. They're completely out of you know, they have no control right now of what's going on. And they're in our house. Right. And our house is terrifying. Right. And and we're the, again, we're the guides. We're the ones that know all the important things that need to be done. And it's up to us to, like, tell them about it. And it's one thing if we tell them this stuff and they're very well aware and then they refuse. But it's another thing if they're like, they don't understand the importance and no one's told them it. So they're, they don't care about that machine that's sitting on the bedside table. It's just there. They figure someone will tell us about, tell them about it when they need to know. It's just a decoration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's medical, medical equipment. I can't touch that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a th weird thing to me and I won't use it until someone tells me how to use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like, if you've never been in the hospital before and you've never seen an incentive barometer before, I would assume that if I needed to use something that looked like that, Someone would tell me how to. I would not. It looks strange. It is a weird thing. It's not like and you I, know what it's for. Yeah, I wouldn't like play with it. And, <laughs> and even if I did, I wouldn't figure it out. I would think it would be trying, getting me to blow out. Yeah. Like everyone thinks. Yep. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> so one last quick one I wanted to say too is um, as part of basics is also considering the environment the patient is in too. Um, if it's really chaotic and loud um, and the patient is agitated, considering like the noise level, the the lighting level. And I do say that with a caveat because, you know, during the day it's helpful to have the natural light in the room so they cannot get their days and nights confused. That's very important with preventing delirium. But you know what? If it's in the middle of the night and they're really agitated and you've got the bright lights on and the alarm on mm -hmm. or, and the alarm on and you're not silencing it or not changing the parameters or whatever <laughs> it needs to be and there's loud people at the nurse's station. We well, can be loud. Nurses can nurses be are so loud. And we don't I don't I don't think we're meaning to be disrespectful. I think that, you know, we're on night shift, those of us who might be working nights. This is our awake time. We got to stay awake. We got to stay busy. So we're having a conversation about whatever's going on, whether it be work related or home related or whatever. But you have to really be cognizant of where are the patients located around you. Mm -hmm. So you have someone who's very confused. You know, sundowning is very real. It gets worse at night sometimes. And sometimes just making it quieter in the room and mm -hmm. the environment will make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I think a big way to help kind of get your mind around it is to pretend, imagine that you are in a patient or you're in a bed and you can't move your body and you can't speak. What would, what would calm you? And you're hearing beeps and sounds and right. So if that means asking the loved <clears throat> one what their favorite music is mm -hmm. and, or there, if there's a, one TV show that they mm -hmm. watch all the time that makes them feel at home. So mm -hmm. for me, that would be The Office on repeat. Oh, I would know man. I'm safe. Oh, if see, I, I can thought hear that. Friends. That too. Yep. I would also know <laughs> Which I'm safe with that. You and can't find right now until middle of the summer. I know, ridiculous, um, ridiculous. But anyways, bitter. like if I like, and that's me. But like, um, I I actually remember I retweeted something that mentioned that. I, uh, I follow a bunch of ICU nurses on Twitter, but one had mentioned saying how she had a patient who was really agitated and her, her overheard the family talking about him liking a certain kind of music. So she played it on her phone and his heart rate went down. He, he was much less agitated. Now I'm not saying you need to use your data on your phone. It has, you know, under, but like those little things can really make a big difference. And especially if you're all there in your brain, but you can't move your limbs or speak, what would calm you down? Mm -hmm. And what would really 
work you up and kind of consider that kind of stuff when you're taking care of your patients and and uh, and walking in the room and considering the um, environment, I guess, is my take yeah. with that. Ask your family members, you know, you know, what what's some of what do they have a nickname? Some people don't like to be called by their first and last name, yeah. you know, or um, and even sometimes family members bringing in pictures of their pets oh, or, I love that. you know, or, you know, asking family members, you know, sometimes families will say, you know, don't bring up this subject or don't talk about this. Just kind of being aware. Of yeah. Or if there's, if you overhear to that know they know them, things that they like and maybe they're out of it, but you can still like bring up like, I don't know if it's a sports team right. or whatever it is. I don't know that those, those things can really calm somebody down. You don't, we don't need to just like medicate people into submission right like sometimes we could <laughs> or just you know, talk straight up about the medical stuff i mean i think it's it's good to have try to have a conversation with them about events of the day or, yeah like hey here's what's going you know, on it here's... snowed last night or yeah yeah it's a, you know it's a rainy day you don't want to be outside or <laughs> yeah no that kind of stuff it makes mm-hmm. them i think it humanizes their dehumanizing experience i mm-hmm. guess i don't know mm-hmm. so all right i think that's all our are our ba- all our basics all right guys the beginning of it yeah the beginning of the basics <laughs> now what was what was it um check your bases to save your, your faces, faces y'all <laughs> <laughs> um if you would like our show notes freshrn.com slash 42 and um i would love if you guys could take a moment a really free quick way to support our podcast is ratings and um reviews those really help and subscri- subscriptions and whatnot, that really, really makes a big difference. Um, so a- a- if you can take a moment to do that, we would be ever so appreciative. Um, so thanks nurses and we'll see you next week. Stay fresh. Damn crowd better hit the floor. All the other fellas better run for the door. Stop, drop and roll with me. I got the heat that'll make you scream.